exceptional items, which used to be included above here, is now put below. Uh, so, uh, but, and that's the bailout cost here. So the bailout cost, and we are including the bailout cost because the bailout cost, energy, road, and uh, which emanated to the banking sector levy, ought to have been paid out of ESLA. But ESLA is being treated as revenue, and therefore, otherwise, it will not be shown. That's why in the 2016 budget, it wasn't shown, because it was ring-fenced completely for payment. But once you have included the revenue, it means you must. So if you come here, this is what it means. And this is your deficit, 37 billion, those of you who are familiar. But when something happens, if you take the tables, the bailout cost is shown as a negative. And so when you take the tables, you see that the deficit is reduced to 31 before the bailout cost is added. So this 37 is the same. You can see it's about the same as here. But if you do not deduct, a, a deduction means that we are expecting to repay the loans you know, we are taking for <coughs> bailout costs and the rest. I think nobody expects that. We've pointed this out, whether it's an arithmetical error, but we have added it, and if you add it, it means we are looking at financing 45 billion, right, debt. So we want to explain in, in, in table form and the red, the dependence, that's why we say that the budget is dependent on debt. This is the situation facing it. In fact, even the money here, yeah, amortization, the loans that we took previously, which we have to pay for here, right, when it's added, because ordinarily we should have paid that from our own revenue. But we have no one borrow, you know, to pay for that as well. Okay. The other thing you want to pay attention to is that the IMF $1 billion that we got, which often would have gone to Bank of Ghana for balance of payment support, it's shown in the budget. But the inflow when the IMF gave us the money and landed in Bank of Ghana is not shown in revenue. It's not part of this revenue. Neither is, are we told specifically on what are we spending. That's one treatment, and that's a conventional treatment, in which case it shouldn't have been. But here it is shown in financing. So what does it mean? It means that the budget is so tight that that IMF money is not going to do anything, you know, big, as we can see, like Terminal 3 or other things, you know, because capital we are borrowing. So it means that money is actually financing the deficit. That's why it's in, it's in financing. You know, so if you ask yourself, so it's, I don't think it's the whole amount, maybe part of it is supporting Bank of Ghana, but whatever came into the budget is being shown as financing. It's not being shown as an inflow, and for us to see in what tangible. Well, it is possible that the financing here relates to some expenditure. It may be financing some capital projects here, but the budget is silent on that. I don't think any of us has heard how that one billion is going to be used. So is it going to be treated as we say fungible, right, which is the way people wanted us to use a sinking fund? You know, which we said, no, we are not going to use it to reduce deficit. We are going to use it to repay debt, which we used to pay the first sovereign bond. 50 million out of that was paid from our oil revenue. So we need to take note of this. So it's not 37. The deficit is around 45, you know, billion. Okay. So we show this same in percentage, you know, of uh, GDP, right? Now, it is showing the deficit, you know, to be financed at 9%. But please note that in between, we, we have those tables, in between the, the presentation of the 2021 budget, which had the projection for 2022 GDP, the media review, which had the projection for GDP, the GDP has been revised to 500. That is one thing. We have spoken about the ambitious nature, I don't want to repeat it, of the revenue targets. But are we going to achieve this revenue? In fact, the media review for last year, we were supposed to be getting 
to be at about 480, which has now gone up to about 500. So again, we wait for statistical service to come. If we do not hit these numbers or hit by another crisis, then one element is that these ratios will change. We know the GDP goes up. But it will change on the deficit, increase on the deficit and the expenditure side, but improve the revenue, right? So if we were to use those old GDP numbers, I'm only drawing your attention, the revenue would have been, you know, much higher. So it means the expectation would even be higher. So even with a, an ambitious GDP, we still have an ambitious revenue, right? And that is what makes the task, you know, uh, a bit difficult for us to, so here we take out, we just condense it. So now we just use the 2021 budget provisional actual, we take out the cumulative, you know, and then we run some commentaries. We've made the first point, it has been made already. It's ambitious, revenue is ambitious. The other two speakers have said it. Expenditure is high, you know it. And both of them excludes the IMF SDR, which is shown, you know, in financing. The other thing we need to note is that this, uh, 2021, we estimated arrears to be 3.7 billion. And then it was repeated in the media, in the probable actual, exact same amount. Now this is falling to 1,900, right? Are we sure that the entire, even contractors are saying they are owed 3 billion, 5 billion? They said it openly. And in one of my debates, even with the government reps, you know, the enlarged arrears was stated at about 16 billion, right? That is if you take the contract database approach, which we did, you know, which was said to be NDC leaving high, you know, uh, 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 arrears, right? So again, whilst we are seeing ambitious, very ambitious revenue targets, we see very conservative, you know, areas. I personally, or our uh, PFM tax, do not believe that our total areas is 1.9. If you look at wage areas, you look at what is owing to contractors, you look at, unless some of these are being paid off budget, which itself would infringe the Public Financial Management Act. So again, this is something that we have to note. So we've mentioned GDP, IMF, SDR treatment, in addition to the bailout cost. Now the interesting thing is that you will see that while the bailout cost is shown as a footnote, I tweeted this, you know, as a footnote, when it comes to exceptional revenue, like the IMF, you know, bailout, that one will show it above the line. So you see the inconsistency. And these are some of the reasons why the IMF, Fitch, and others are reporting different debt figures from what you know, we are reporting. They are reporting different deficit figures from what you know, the GOG is reporting because of these changes. So we need to get into the nuances of the budget. It's not just a headline. You know, as well, financial journalists need to go into a bit more detail on that. <clears throat> OK. So again, we express the same thing as a percentage of you know, uh, GDP uh, with the new GDP numbers, which is what is in the budget. And you can see the structure. So what we are trying to do here is to introduce you to the budget lines and the items and the impact they have. So the big problem we have, and let me say that the rest, uh, in fairness, if you go back, we have just like uh, the two doctors, professors have shown, we have similar, at least since the rebasing of 2013. And the rest have been there. Sometimes they cover recurrent expenditure. And sometimes, that's why when we had oil and we created single fund and other, you know, it covers slightly capital expenditure. But ordinarily, you should borrow, you shouldn't borrow to pay capital, sorry, you should borrow to pay capital, not recurrent expenditure. That is one measure of you know, sustainable fiscal management. And then you should be able to pay past debt from your own revenues. You shouldn't borrow to be paying that. And that's why the sinking fund was created. You know, I like the narrative in looking at governments and, the, you know, and how we, we go about it. But I think we need to also look at you know, certain initiatives within those governments, such as 
we dam which came in to salvage, for example, the power crisis, because part of the oscillation that the two professors were showing were the result of crisis. Drought, which affects power, so your budget is thrown off hinge. External factors, it's not just the interest rates. Once commodity prices fall, you know, then you take the heat. Like 2014, you know, and then 2019, 2020, COVID, the price of crude oil fell. You know, but we also need to compare governments, you know, I think in fairness, in a certain way, right? The Rawlings administration never had oil. The Kufu administration discovered oil, right? <laughs> but never had oil. The Mills administration benefited from oil. But it's one field. The current administration benefited from three oil fields, right? So we should look at the endowment which Ghanaians have given the administrations, and I beg to differ in the sense that if we are two oil fields, you know, making three outputs increase from 70, you know, thousand barrels to nearly 200,000 barrels, and we are in this situation, what is the guarantee that a new oil field, you know, would help us, you know, resolve the situation? Our history is not pointing to that, because we've dismantled stabilization fund, we've dismantled you know, sinking fund. These are the instruments which other middle-income countries use to stabilize their fiscal situation. I can bet that the next crisis that will hit us, which is inevitable, there will be nothing in the stabilization fund because we are clean, we are cleaning it. We took 250 billion, uh, sorry, million US dollars for COVID. It's completely depleted. And the next crisis, we cannot depend on it. Nothing in the contingency fund. Nothing in the sinking fund. It's going to go to zero. Okay. So we use this structure for you to see. This is just a repetition. We have condensed it so you can see, you know, the rest again where they sat. So the mark of fiscal consolidation is that we must move this, uh, we must move these rest, begin to move them, the black down. The black should come and cover recurrent, cover part of our capital, cover entire amortization. Red means is we are borrowing more than we are paying, it's obvious. So these are the areas where the black has to cover. You know, and you can do that either by reducing expenditure, you know, or getting some, revamping your, your tax system. Not necessarily through uh, rates. You know, the impression that new tax handles, and we'll come to that. Uh, the solution is itself erroneous. We are going back to pre GRP SAP. We are going back, those of us who have worked in it, we are going back to the economic recovery program SAP pre era when we rationalize our taxes, right? And we'll come to that briefly. So, next. This is also the same thing we present. The reason we present GDP and not the nominal is that, as I said, you can prepare a uh, compare the GDP as if nothing happened of one administration progressively with the other. You know, from another Kufo era, you can say that the services sector expanded very fast. That was one of the major products of HIPIC that we had. It opened space, you know, construction and others. So it was during that era, going into the mid era, that services overtook, you know, agri, right? So that's the benefit of that era. You can say that, so we should also look at some of the benefits, you know, of those errors, right? Then the Mills, you know, uh, 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 Mahama era, you know, followed, you know, the infrastructure and other things, new innovations, sinking fund, infrastructure fund, and all those things, greater out of the oil fields. But the, the bottom line is that the GDP is never the same. The other thing that affects the GDP, and we must be careful when we are talking about revenue, as if GRA is not performing, is that we rebase our GDP. And when you rebase your GDP, the numerator increases, but your revenue is the same. So it's not just debt that falls when you rebase, right? So we are talking about a rebased economy. We are also talking about an economy where uh, if you go back, look at the IMF charts and the rest, and I appeal to the professors to look at some of these things, we did not do monetization. There were two monetization programs. The Rollins era 50 CDs, if you remember, those of you who are old enough. And then 
cutting off four zeros. <laughs> so the value of the GDP, the, you know, the effectiveness of the currency, you know, is not the same, right? I mean, to put it, the city is not the same. We now know that the value is not the same. Because when we monetize, it became one to one. It was about 12,000 or something to the cities, uh, cities to, to the dollar. So we should also look at these nuances that has happened in our economy as we go along. But GDP is often a barometer because as even the good scripture says, <laughs> and I'm not preaching, you know, uh, to whom uh, much is given, more is what is to be expected. Yeah. <clears throat> so again, you see the dependency, anything the rest. So you see revenue begins to vanish and then debt takes over. Anything below, graphically again, this is a situation facing us, right? Um, yeah, these are the not debt numbers. I think they've been presented. Let me just make one point. You see, we are reporting different figures, debt figures. I listened to the controversy over Bloomberg. The fact is that there's a Bank of Ghana statement itself, which is quoting our debt at 83. Granted that the 83 that they quoted is not for 2020, 2021 or for 2020. It means that at 80%, if our deficit, as the professors pointed out, is the bottom line is red. If we are borrowing and we are not repaying debt in net terms, but we are borrowing, it means that we are going to increase the debt. So showing me 70 something in September, right, with three months to go, we will definitely hit the 80. It may be nice, you know, in the year, you know, it would have been good if the Minister of Finance had given us precisely what was the probable actual debt. By now, there's some fair idea of it at the end of 2021, you know, to settle the debate, not to go back and use the September and other, you know. So let us wait and see. By the first quarter, the Public Financial Management Act requirements now say that these figures must be disclosed by then, you know, but I'm also convinced that our debt will go above 80. Unless, of course, as a government debt, they exclude the bailout cost. But the IMF will add it, FIT will add it, others will add it. Because there's a difference between the deficit we show on a narrow basis. Bank of Ghana talks about the narrow basis. Bank of Ghana urges to go back to the broad basis. There's a difference between the narrow basis financing and adding the exceptional cost which previous governments have done, right? And once you add it, and that is what the global, you know, international agencies are adding, because they realize that you have to finance it. If you exclude it, does it mean you haven't financed it? You're only financing it maybe off the budget or no report, record, uh, reporting what is in the gift list and what is in the Bank of Ghana system. So um, that's why we show, and sometimes interestingly, of course, Bank of Ghana is often ahead because of their system, their cash, and the wages, you know, be more superior. But sometimes you have a divergence between what Bank of Ghana is reporting, the Monetary Policy Committee, and what Ministry of Finance is reporting, even though it's Ministry of Finance that should have been providing those figures. Okay, next. <clears throat> yeah, next. Okay, so here, the same graph that was shown from the 60s historically or 70s all the way, we show a snapshot from 2013. And you can see if sometimes when you show the segments, then it's not, it may not be so disheartening. The reason we did 2013 is that we don't want to use different bases. You know, because we rebased in 2013 in 2006, right? We have those, but we don't have time, those segments. But you can see positive periods in all the administrations, right? And I think sometimes we should accentuate the positive and ask ourselves, what is it that accounted for that? So when you take a shorter segment, you know, from 2013, which we call the scorecard, you can see that, yes, um, this is the, the various, it is going up here, going up. This is the bailout costs, which are often left out. You see, they are standing on their own. So you can see the difference. Here it is only one measurement. But you can see from 2017, we now have two measurements because we are taking the bailout cost, right? But you can see that this is the rate of growth 
which I think Prof. Uh, Tio and uh, uh, Prof. Safwa, you know, mentioned. But you can see that the, the, um, the policies that were called smart borrowing led to a decline in the rates when we started to apply part of the oil money to repay debt and to whatever, we say, let's not do the same way like cocoa and gold and the rest. The decline was there, you can see. And then you see, so you can see in the total there's a, a tapering that was taking place. So this is the, the situation. But the point is that it is going up. And if you show it in terms of the rate of growth, you can see the sharp increase. And that increase occurred only immediately after hip, uh, hip peak, when we had a space and we borrowed quite a bit. Okay, next. <clears throat> so the same picture, right, next. Sorry, sorry, can we go back? This is inflation. And uh, this is the chart again which was shown on uh, GDP. Let me make one point on inflation. The basket was changed in 2018. It's like comparing, you know, debt to GDP ratio in the Kufua era <laughs> before rebasing, right? So I appeal to the authorities. You see, when we take too much credit and we don't qualify it, I mean, the temptation is for every government to do it. I know that, right? Sometimes we fail to understand why it seems different. Just as services sector became larger, the agric products in computing the inflation also is becoming more and more, you know, services also coming. So the basket was changed in 2018. So it is a structural change that's resulted in some of that inflation going down. It is not absolutely, yes, it happened. You can't take it away, just as you can't take away, you know, re uh, oil fine and things which have, you know, previous administrations. But I think a bit of candidness is required, especially when these figures are being quoted by our institutions, not politicians. Right, I think it's very important that, you know, so that uh, the professors and others can, you know, uh, do the analysis <laughs> for us, even if we don't see it in the open, we see it in the background, I can assure you. So this is, uh, these are interest rates again. You could see interest rates within that short segment were trending down already, right? If this graph were stretched back, often it ends at 2016, but if it were stretched back, you see that interest rates went. And this trending down occurred with two events. I think the professor mentioned how to tackle debt. One of them is the refinancing, which he mentioned, right? The 2015 bond, the entire one billion, nothing went to the budget for current expenditure. It went into refinancing, the one at 10.2%. Refinancing means that just as you go to your bank and you say, oh, okay, add my interest to the three bill, right, and reinvest, because the three bill rate is high. It, it only means that you are financing government. Government is not paying the debt, so you are financing it. So we use it to clear off much of the outstanding, the domestic, and then we use the oil revenue to support it, to pay off the Kufour bond, and that's when these interest rates started going down. So they are due to specific policy interventions. Policy interventions, you know, work. And especially when you have new, new resources like oil, you know, then that is when you use. Because as for the old money, <laughs> it's already tight. So when you have new money, you close your eyes and do certain things, you know, to change the economy. Okay. Uh, next. So Ilevi, look. The issue is a technical one. I'm not talking politics. I'm not talking NDC. It's a technical one. What is e-levy? Are we so desperate that we are beginning to tax investment? That's the question, right? And those who follow me, Twitter, I ask, what is the difference? What is the difference if I put my money under my pillow, right? and go back and take it and spend. And me taking that money to the bank, in my savings account in particular, and then I spend. And thanks to the electronics, the young people, instead of the bank, they put it in their pocket, in their what? Cell phone, wallet. It's the same savings, right? It's the same savings. So you don't tax savings. So when I take my money and I invest it in this hotel 
and I make profit, I pay corporate income tax. But you don't tax my savings. If I take my money from my bank and I go and start trading, you see AMA and others coming to collect, you know what, their levies and the rest. That's when I pay. They're assuming that you are paying the tax on income. When you are paid, your PAYE has been deducted. All of us here, we are employees. Your tax is deducted as source. And then you take the difference. Government has taken the income tax already. Then you take the difference and you go and put it on your wallet. And then you transfer it to your poor mother and then you are saying that you want to tax that too. After you have paid taking the tax, this is the tax on tax, which is being explained. I think we should get the philosophical point clear, right? Now, if you take that money and you buy T-bills, we don't tax T-bills. That's where they tax it. Look, we have a very rational tax system, and let's not destroy it. That's the point we are making. And these, these things were corrected in the 1980s and 1990s, you know, leading to a lot of pain and bloodshed and others, you know, by demonstrations and the rest. But all of us Ghanaians went through the pain in streamlining those, structure, those structures. Now, when you take that savings, when you take that savings and you come and book a hotel here, you know, you go and buy food in the supermarkets and whatever, you are doing what? You are spending. You are consuming. This time you are not investing. So it is the spending that attracts VAT, whether the commodity you are buying is imported or domestic. It is the spending that attracts import duty, if it is import, you see? And it's not on domestic. And it is the spending that attracts, you know, other taxes and levies. Not the spending, not the savings, sorry, not the savings, right? So apart from that, we are killing initiative. We are killing an industry, right? Bank of Ghana acknowledged that the electronic you know, read these statements carefully, the one that was issued by Bank of Ghana. They said that they had used, you know, the part of the growth of that sector as an intervention, as one of the interventions during the COVID. Is there? Right? Is there? Um, provided various interventions within the mobile money space. For example, temporarily suspending transaction fees on minimum transactions of 100. You see where the 100 is coming from? And increase, but that was positive, a positive 100. And increasing wallet limits to promote electronic transactions as part of COVID protocols. Is this the initiative we want to be taxing? By the way, so those fees and others are attracting Communication service tax, it wasn't mentioned, right? Communication service tax, they're attracting VAT. Now we have other, and let's not forget that, the levy error, this is a levy error. <laughs> yeah? Of course, I, we did a levy, ESLA, right? Which should have gone off by now, five years, it's not gone. So it was increased, sorry. I took at you, okay. So here. Yeah. There was an increase in personal income tax in 2018-2019. You remember it from 30 percent. Personal income tax used to be 65-55 percent corporate income tax. In the ERP sub era, it took a lot to reduce it. And when you the the the, the target at the time was to be like the middle income and advanced countries, no more than 25 percent, the top marginal rate. We got to 30, and then we took it back to 35. Is it progressive or regressive? You have increased in rates, and we extended the ESLA. Remember the new sales tax, right? The rates for ESLA levy was increased twice, 2018 and, 2018 and 2019 or 2020. ESLA was increased. We issue ESLA bonds. And instead of five years, now we use issue seven year, 10 year. It means that we are extending the tax over the period. That's what it means. If you go and take an ESLA bond, a loan, it means that the ESLA is not lapsing. 
It means that the tax has been extended, not directly, openly, but through going to take a bond. That is what it means. So that's one levy. Then we blocked input tax credit. And let's be careful. When we were blocking the input tax credit, get fund, and we made it straight levies. Some of us predicted that you are going to encourage evasion and avoidance. Today, VAT is being overtake, uh, overtaken by income tax, right? Cement complained, breweries complained, if you remember when that thing was done. You are blocking, and when you block it, they add it to cost. It increases prices. That itself was a revenue measure that never materialized because consumers react. If you can afford, you know, and businesses don't like paying higher taxes. So that itself was another tax measure. Now, we also have uh, the reversal of the benchmark, which will increase. Then we have FinSEC, uh, sorry, FinSEC levy, despite ESLA, we now have a FinSEC financial sector levy for the cleanup. ESLA was meant for the cleanup. <laughs> so what is this FinSEC coming from? ESLA is supposed to bring 45 billion, you know, the ESLA report itself by 2025, right? And if true, the debt is 21 billion, why can't we take a loan of, you know, for 30 billion and clear it, right? So this is another debt that is coming. Then you have the National Fiscal Stabilization Levy, right, which was put in place and never removed, and a new one was added. You have the COVID-19 levy, yet we say that the economy is growing because we are in a post-COVID era. So why is the levy not going away? And we had five billion, nearly five billion, right, to cater for COVID alone. IMF one billion, right, the loan. You can add SDL, one billion, right? World Bank and the rest gave us 600, nearly 800 you know, million. Bank of Ghana, 1.7 billion. Right, and counting for one crisis. Yes, we understand that it's severe. So we are saying that all these have been added. Then we have the Delta Fund, we have sanitation and pollution levy, all of which used to come from the one VAT, the one import duty, and the rest. Ladies and gentlemen, we used to have something called super sales tax. We used to have other service taxes. We don't have time. During the question time, I can read it out for you. You can go and uh, the Service uh, uh, Tax Act, it specifies the number of services, then it was extended, so the Service Tax Act 529, before the VAT came, and then we said let's have a uniform consumption tax on, instead of all these multiple levies at different rates, let's have a uniform tax on everybody's consumption expenditure, and that is VAT. Today we are going back, right? post kumi pre -kum. We have not taken of the VAT, but we are going back and imposing, you know, those levies again. And the very sales taxes that were, you know, as you, and interestingly, I'll read it for you. One of the innovations, later there was an innovation, uh, two of them, let me point out, Telcos, mobile phone, that's when they were started, Act 529. That was when it was coming, right? And then the other one was what we call DSTV today. It used to be what? Uh, yes. Self service tax was put on it. But we are saying, let's use VAT so that it doesn't matter. OK? So if today, if today it is telcos that are booming, when oil services, because we are having oil and want to be a hub, when oil services do start rising and they are paying VAT, you are going to put another levy on it. Does it mean any sector that is emerging, we are going to be putting in any you know? So there's a professional point about what is being said. It's not all politics. It's about tax reform. It's about the regime. Our main tax handles are excise. It punishes you if you go and drink alcohol. It punishes you if you go and smoke. You know, you bring expensive cars and you want to show off. Those are the ones that attract excise. Import duty on only imports to protect our local industries. And that is why the benchmark did not, was anti-domestic industry, because it reduced the cost of imports and allowed a lot of things to come in. 
and therefore it's local industry that became less protected. That's the meaning of the benchmark. Import duty is protective. We have VAT, which we all pay. Then we say, wait a minute, let's all put it on education, basic education, textbooks, health, basic drugs, and the rest. So we exempt that, right? Then we have the income tax, right? So these are our tax handles. If we have a problem, it is not a revenue problem, it's an expenditure problem, right? That the way we had others like single spine and the rest, who says public servants did not deserve you know, a higher pay? But it was hurting the economy, so there was a pause. And therefore, the rationalization of single spine after the mistake should have continued. Today, we are not even able to negotiate with labor, despite you know, uh, that policy. So, uh, in closing, I just want to also agree that, you know, the essence of a program, whether it's a homegrown program or a center program, frankly, is to tackle everything that has been said. It's not to just use one handle to try and resolve all the problems. No. Taxation alone will not resolve it. And all that we are doing is distorting. And I'm saying there's a, lev there's a lesson from the straight levies which we thought was going to bring in a lot of revenue. You see, the reason is that, take this hotel, we have come to rent, they will charge us VAT, right? Then the, 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 the VAT that they charge on the drinks and things which we are paying for, uh, which they charge on the furniture and everything, it's a consumption tax, it's not a business tax, right? It's a consumption tax, not a business tax. So we say, if you pay something on it for business purposes, that's not the purpose of the tax. Let's give you back a credit or a refund. So you offset it against what you are charging the organizers of PFM Tax Africa. We block it, thinking that if we block it, the one we block will bring in more money. It never brought in money. <laughs> you know, because either demand goes down for those products, or you encourage evasion and avoidance. You know, and so for many people, maybe the banks and the rest, the affluent, they very soon then predict checks will come back again. People will not do mobile transfer. Checks, I would rather write my check, <laughs> right? Then do a transfer for my using my wallet. I would rather ask my bank to go and do the transfer, right? And this is what we call avoidance. If I can avoid the tax, I'll avoid it. To put it crudely, I'll go to the Phoenix uh, Norris station and give money to somebody traveling to go and give to my old lady. Because the impact could be high. So quite apart from that, we are saying it is a tax on tax. It is a tax which is regressive. You know, it's a regressive, it's more regressive than the VAT, which was a Kumi Preko sing song. Because it's taxing, Consumption. Remember when I take it and I spend, I'm going to pay the VAT, I'm going to pay all of those things. And in addition, I'm going to pay again, you know, a tax on my savings. After you have paid, you have collected a PAYE from my salary already, which I'm just saying, 